back to Linux Weekly Daily Wednesday, where we sit back, relax, take that midweek break, talking about some of the fun no, things hello. going on in the world of Linux and open source. I'm Vin Stone, joined by Joe Bryant and Pedro Mateus. we got a chunky, Hello. chunky show for you <laughs> this afternoon. We're even going to take a little peek at micro- what, what passes for Microsoft Linux distribution, so stay tuned for that. But before we get going, we do like to see uh, what's transpired in our lives since mm-hmm. last week and... Jill, you went to Disneyland, but um, you've also been cleaning your room. Yeah, yeah. You should, so I've you been really doing should more. clean that room. Come on. Oh no, it's it's <laughs> it's dust free. I'm just uh, moving all the computers out and getting ready to uh, repaint and put new carpet in and and such. <laughs> right on, Pedro. Have you done anything? Uh, work mostly. I played the game mm-hmm. yesterday. Uh, thank you, Arthurin, for uh, gifting me that game a good few months mm-hmm. ago. That was actually the most I'd played of that game up until now because, hey, I don't have time. <laughs> so, yeah, it's uh, th- that, it's actually a very nice game. Ghost of a Tale. It's, uh, if you've been curious about it, I'd say give it a try. <laughs> you play as an adorable little rat and you run around and spread the plague. <laughs> no, 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 no. Aww. You're running from the rats. You're a mouse. A teeny tiny little mouse. <laughs> Cute little mouse. <laughs> Leave that alone. I'll just go to go ahead and say that the flying spaghetti monster has been testing me as of late because I got enough uh, video card prices are finally coming out of the exosphere. They're doing mm-hmm. it slowly, but and I have got enough money squirreled away to get a thirty sixty for the box here in the studio with the twelve gigs. And I was talking about um, Saturday with Pedro. I'm like, oh, I see how it is. I see how it is. Amazon. There was a some control surface that it was ridiculously priced. And it was like seven hundred dollars, and they dropped it to like three ninety nine. Like, really, really? <laughs> now that I have four fifty budgeted for um, like that's how it is. I let it go. Let it go. It it's went back to regular price. I'm like, okay, you know what? I, I passed that test. Good try, fate. I'm, I'm not going to burn that money. <laughs> um, I guess Red booper. you're gonna have to get that thread booper. <laughs> Currently, right now on Amazon, the Threadripper 2970 WX is four hundred and fifty-five dollars. <laughs> it's a five dollars extra, just as a, a big uh, a screw you. <laughs> it's it, 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 you know. Eight hundred dollars off regular price. <laughs> Amazing. Flying spaghetti monster, give me straight. Ben is so tempted. <laughs> very, very tempted to pull the trigger on that. But you know what? Our nineteen twenty X. I'm compower. I don't run into video rendering issues with the nineteen twenty X. I run into video <laughs> rendering issues with the twenty sixty. I'm going to stick to my guns in this, but. There you go. You can go out and buy it if you get that spare pocket change and you want to upgrade your Gen 1 or Gen 2 thread ripping system. All right. So we got some exciting news right before we went live from Twitch of all places. We don't normally talk about Twitch on the show. We do that on Saturday on Linux Emcast. And they wanted to, you know, how There's can we improve tag. browsing, <laughs> filtering, and searching? And a long time ago. Now, this is shared this idea on September 22nd. This has come up multiple times. Support for games on Linux can be inconsistent. So, hey, maybe we could put a little search tag. You know, Linux, that crazy new thing that's been out for coming up on 30 years. It'd be a boon. Well, today, right before the show, July 14th, um, Dowski, Linux tag is now live on Twitch. Thank you so much for this feedback. And please let us know if there are tags you would like to see live on the site. Yay. Yay. Uh, okay. <laughs> Yay. This True is awesome. True story. <laughs> True story. Um, you know, it, it only took, what, 11 years because we've been asking for a Linux tag since. It's we, been a while. <laughs> I would say since we've been on Twitch, but we've been doing this since it was just in TV. So <laughs> yeah, you got to keep that in mind. We, we, we've been around for a minute. They finally did it. Good on you. And throw your Linux tags on your Linux streams. That's what I'm going to be searching for from now on. Now, maybe. Maybe we can start a petition for Legasp, a Linux category, and mm-hmm. possibly sometime by 2032, 2033, 
they'll get around to approving that. But I'm going to say good work on that. That makes me happy, um, especially for like searching for stuff. You know, even when I'm searching in science and technology, I would like to be able to like, hey, let's see who's playing around with Linux as opposed to who's doing X, Y, and Z. You no, know, very happy. Yeah. I, I look forward to Patreon never forgetting nice. to use the links tag from now on. <laughs> hopefully they'll remember it like they used to do with the tags you just put a tag there and they just leave them typical That'd Mateus nice. strat <laughs> well if it does it for me it'll happen <laughs> yes <laughs> I'm lazy <laughs> hashtag yeah, this will be so nice I've spent you know probably the last five or six years just searching for Linux streamers on Twitch and I found a lot of them but I had to work at it <laughs> to find them it's <laughs> good news <laughs> So, we just wanted to give that a mention before we get right into the regular stuff, starting with Ubuntu 21.10, we got a release date and planned features. Yay, this is exciting. So, Ubuntu 21.10, Impish Indri, will be released on October 14th of this year. And here is actually a progress report of new features thus far. And this is exciting. Ubuntu 21.10 will probably ship with GNOME 40 since GNOME 40 is released in September. So that is actually really good, cool. So we'll get to play with it then. And uh, what's nice is Ubuntu actually will still use the Ubuntu dock on the left side of the screen instead of at the bottom like GNOME 40 does, which I think is really good for the Ubuntu users who are used to it on the left-hand side. But, you know, give you an option to move it. <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> so, <laughs> So, and uh, another cool thing is Wayland will be enabled by default for NVIDIA driver users. Yay! So, we have it on Fedora 34, and now it's time for Ubuntu. Yes, and very also, nice. it's very, very nice. And as we were talking about a few years, year, a few weeks ago, the Yaru light theme will be default. So, we won't be able to have a mixed theme of dark and light. We'll either have a light theme or a dark theme. <laughs> yep. so. Because no 40. Hey, let's introduce more limitations. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I, I did read the uh, blog post that uh, one of the GNOME developers released today or yesterday. That basically made every single point that I've been railing on. So mm -hmm. I'm good. <laughs> no. the, I'm, I am curious about, uh, because Jill already mentioned that the, there's still the Unity style dock on the left side, so that's one extension. At least one we already know for a fact is there. <laughs> I, I am going to install it at least when they either the beta or the feature freeze at any one of those points to see just how many extensions they require to, you know, be able to use GNOME by default. Mm. <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be nice to have a dash to panel or dash to dock integrated, wouldn't it, Pedro? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so in all honesty, Pedro, how many extensions do you have to add to GNOME 40 to make it as unstable as KDE? Uh, the moment you enable them, if you ask the GNOME developers, because they're completely unsupported. <laughs> <laughs> it's always good news for my brothers and sisters out there running the Ubuntu's, but... Something that we've been dragging on this show for a long time is basically pine everything because they had a great idea. Let's make some development hardware. Let's get it out in the hands of people. Let's do it with mobile. Let's do it with tablets. Let's do it with watches. And they did the most difficult thing out of all of it is they managed to ship products reliably. And yes. I've been very impressed with that. Mm -hmm. Now, they released the Nutcracker Challenge. I know. I know. Listen, I'm 12 too. Um, <laughs> to work towards a blob-free Wi-Fi and Bluetooth uh, chip for the BL602 and, you know, as part of Hacktoberfest in 2020. Somebody took him up on the challenge. And this is basically, dude received his board. I, I would like to play around with this. I really would. They, they sent him a kit. Play around. He goes through it. This is incredibly, incredibly detailed. But you can go through the reverse engineering of the risk of BL602 and it is detailed. We we're talking red yarn on pictures in the background detail. <laughs> um <laughs> way above my pay grade, but still fascinating to read through. And he's made 
a lot of progress and that he's done most of the legwork for creating an open source Wi-Fi driver uh, for the BL602, which kudos to you, sir. Um, very well, very well done. That is impressive. You know, having like the idea that of what Pine is doing here is basically they created their own little module and okay, we can't actually ship out open source drivers uh, for you to be able to use them. But hey, if the community wants to do it, we're not opposed to it. <laughs> so they basically, here's a challenge. You want to do it? We'll send you a board. That, that's very nice. Mm. That's very nice. But yeah, no, the FCC might have something to say if they decide to ship the open source drivers out of the box. So up to distro maintainers, yeah. I guess. <laughs> well, last time we mentioned this, um, somebody from Pine got a hold of me on Twitter. It's like, hey, hey, hey. Just, yeah. <laughs> just, just be perfectly clear. I'm like, we were, we were, don't worry, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> we're not shipping this. Yes. The distro maintainers can ship it. Manjaro. Uh, everyone else. <laughs> so, um, Pedro and Joe, were you at with um, binary blobs on your Linux devices, considering all three of us are filthy NVIDIA users? Uh, I think they're a necessity. <laughs> yeah, we need open, so more open really source They don't really warm drivers. me or uh, leave me out in the cold. <laughs> it, they're a necessity. That They're a thing that I must use. A cruel reality. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I mean, cool cruel. It's not cruel. Also, it... What were we saying, Joe? Mm. <laughs> Pedro's well, just cool gesticulating. That's okay. <laughs> it doesn't translate to audio very well, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's cool about this is is not only is it going to be uh, th this is great for the the Pine community. It's also great for the Risk Five community and adoption because this is a Risk Five chip. So having, you know, the open source Bluetooth and Wi-Fi blobs will be great for also for RISC-V development. So this, this is really great all around for the community. It's a good way to get your stuff reverse engineered. I've always said not releasing Linux drivers or anything, but they did. And th this is a different case on that. And um, no, no, this makes me very, very happy. And But like binary blob drivers, I can take it or leave it. Normally I'm perfectly fine with it. But I run into a case because um, Kernel 514 RC1 came out a couple of days ago. Like, Ooh, it's got all the fun audio stuff, and I want to go play with it. So I loaded it up, compiled it, and started up on the uh, render box here in the studio. And all was great and right until I remembered I don't have the Black Magic drivers for this, and I surely don't have NVIDIA drivers for this. So, man, this console <laughs> is sweet. Um, <laughs> Yeah. And, yes, Pedro. Uh, no, the compiling the NVIDIA drivers, you might get lucky if there isn't a significant enough ABI change. It might work. The Black Magic drivers, no. <laughs> Sometimes you get lucky with. Scary. Um, but one of the downsides about 5.14 RC1 right now is there's not a real time patch set for it. So the one system that I do have headless in the studio, the one our DOS server, can't really bother with it, but I'm still looking forward to watching it like a hawk. Um, creating amazing 2D motion graphics and vector animations. Not yeah, not on <laughs> super fancy, expensive custom hardware, yeah. but on the web. <laughs> hey, uh, but on the web, this is amazing. So this is Expressive Animator. It's a new 2D motion graphics and vector animation program available for, for Linux. And it works on the Chrome and Microsoft Edge web browsers uh, no firefox love right now <laughs> so but it is currently under development and not all the features work yet but will in the future and they are looking for people to contribute to the project and what's really cool is you can also get it as a standalone application for linux via npm or yarn <laughs> and um <laughs> yeah <laughs> we'll talk about that in a minute <laughs> But anyway, so I tested the browser preview and it does work uh, really great in the Chrome uh, browser. And I was able to add star shapes, animate their positions, transform them via scale and rotate, change their opacity and change their colors easily with an animated color cycle. 
and it was really easy to use. The and the playback of the animation was smooth, which is really great for a web based <laughs> when you're running it on the web. It is it was very stable, and you can save your file locally, which you you really need to <laughs> to be able to do that. And that that's awesome that it does right out of the box. And it's just so nice to have a 2D vector motion graphics option that is open source and that you can use on Linux. It's really cool. And speaking of NPM, yeah, Pedro, I didn't get NPM uh, version installed either. I actually installed the Yarn version. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, no, because <laughs> I looked at it and I looked at the little <laughs> breakdown of uh, languages that GitHub has down the side. It's like, oh, TypeScript. Okay, so JavaScript, Svelte. Okay, front end for JavaScript. Gotcha. HTML, JavaScript, CSS. Right. So how do we build NPM? Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're good. <laughs> I play around with it for a minute. Uh, you know, this is not designed to compete against, you know, the likes of like Nature on New, QDD, or anything like that. Um, yeah. <laughs> this, this is like web based. Think of like uh, Tux Paint Animation level for for kids or somebody interesting. And like, you know, how how do I set? Um, the words escaped me. See, I my brain violently fights against anything that's related to animation or blender or anything. Notes, <laughs> animation notes. And you can make some blocks move around, make them bigger, make them smaller. It's kind of fun. I didn't mind it at all. Unfortunately, like right now, it cannot save or export SVGs. So yeah. it's kind mm -hmm. of a contained thing. You can go to the web zone, link in the description and the show notes, play around with it, have a good time. But uh, yeah. This is kind of fun. Now, as far as the NPM, I saw that and immediately went, oh, look, there's a web version. That's the only way I'm going to tingle with this. <laughs> <laughs> because There's a preview. You could just click on the thing. Yay. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> the last time I had to tangle with Yarn because I'm running the BitFocus Companion server on uh, the Raspberry Pi to power our stream deck here in the studio, I had to tangle with a version mismatch on that. And that was an afternoon of reading the fight. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you know, I'm that. That's why I have an ISO. <laughs> we just put it back the way it was. Good news, everyone. If you use mm -hmm. Tor, you probably thought to yourself, man, everything hoax is getting written in Rust. <laughs> yeah, yes. I'm sure one of the developers behind Tor went like, well, everything else is getting built with Rust. Feeling a little so left out. <laughs> yeah, so it is very much happening. Uh, there's a little project called Artie. Uh, source is available on GitLab. You can go uh, have a look for yourself. Mm -hmm. And it is a project to completely rewrite Tor in Rust. It already has some functionality, but right now it can't access the Onion um, routing protocols. It can't uh, actually act as a Tor node. Basically, it sets up a proxy and that's about it. But very early days, obviously, and the point here is very much to bring Tor to, you know, multi-core land, <laughs> because <laughs> previously it was written in C, yeah. and, well, there's uh, a lot of things that may happen when you're writing code in C that make things less secure, as I'm sure Intel uh, has been finding out over the past however many Spectre variants have appeared. Well, uh, this will be using Rust, which is, you know, geared to be uh, secure out of the box, uh, have memory isolation and everything else, and more importantly, multi-thread aware. So maybe Tor won't be quite so slow going forward. That's what I'm looking forward to. And uh, big thanks to Artherin for bringing this up. Uh, yeah, it was uh, very interesting. I think a good read. <laughs> it is. It's a little bit interesting. But one thing I want to like kind of give a mention is uh, don't use this if you're concerned about privacy right now. They just flat out say that multiple times. So, do you yeah. use Tor, Joe? Yes, I do, actually. What's wrong with I you? I use the Tor. What are you hiding? <laughs> <laughs> I have the Tor browser on my Android phone, <laughs> and I use it on Linux uh, standalone. Do you, yeah. you just find like modern yeah. internet too fast for you? <laughs> I also use Tails too, <laughs> the Tails distribution. <laughs> but I think this is really cool because it is, you know, it eventually will make Tor even more secure. And it will actually probably have the result of making the software even faster because Rust is good that way. <laughs> and, you know, honestly, these are a lot of the reasons why Rust is being suggested for Linux kernel development. 
So there, there is a reason. It's a very good language and very clean and responsive. It, it's very memory yeah. safe. Rust has still got a long way to go for, as far as optimization. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it was good. Mm-hmm. Then that again, the multi-thread awareness does give it That's you know, access to <laughs> the extra horsepower, which everyone seems to be very much on board with. Also a long yeah. way to go. <laughs> Speed-wise. Yeah. yeah. In order to be efficient in its use of the multiple threads. But yeah, no, uh, I think at this point, it's probably safe to say that Rust is surpassing if it hasn't surpassed Ruby already. So, I, I don't mm, think anybody yeah. outside of me <laughs> were comedically making that comparison. I'm like, oh, finally, we've, we've reached peak Rust. <laughs> no more gems. Because Ruby never got a foothold on any Cargo major all things. The things. <laughs> So it is very, very nice to see. Good job, Mozilla. One of your products was successful. I, I'm glad to see, um, <laughs> like I've played around with like the Tor client because that is really the quickest way to check if I'm doing some WebRTC work just to get back into my own network. And mm-hmm. I mean, it works for that. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't, it's not like in the olden times when you when loaded, like, oh, I remember dial-up. Hmm. I mean, <laughs> you got a little bit of a wait, but it's there. And this is a fun project. So I'm going to say good on them. So do I, I'm just going to break this out once. I'm going to break this out. Uh, no, I'm going to do it for the next story. We got a, we got a little bit. Oh, <laughs> we got some sad, sad yeah. news. Strange news, too. I wouldn't have um, guessed yeah, this. Uh, this <laughs> is coming from Tech Radar. Microsoft Edge just left a serious rival and it's dust. That's right. Play the trumpets, sad trombones. Microsoft <laughs> Edge is beating Firefox. This, this can't make this up. Um, now, Chromium-based Edge sits in third position behind only Chrome and Safari, leaving um, Firefox. And, and not necessarily in the dust, but yeah. <laughs> A solid fourth place on that one. <laughs> This has been kind of painful to see because we're all of the age and probably a lot of people in our audience are of the age of, do you remember spreading the word of Firefox even to your Windows brethren and, and sisters? You're like, hey, <laughs> Edge is horrible. Let's get rid of it. And you're like, oh, wow. This is, oh, it's blocks, pop, pops. This is brilliant. Yeah. And Firefox took off. It's just weird to see this coming full circle. It is because, man, IE was so bad at the time, especially on Windows. Firefox was able to come in and eat away market share. And we're talking Mm -hmm. so bad that people went out and installed a different browser than the one that was shipped with the operating system. And that's incredible when when you really think about it. Now, unfortunately, you know, in our little timeline, in our story that we're tailing, uh, Mm -hmm. Firefox, it, it got bloated. It got stagnant. It wasn't a good experience. It was... A bad enough experience where this little upstart called Google uh, came in and launched Chrome. And Chrome was bad. The first versions of Chrome, they were poo. All they did was browser. No plugin support. And not even that very yeah. well. <laughs> Most of the website yeah, just were... wouldn't render properly. Here's the, here's <laughs> yeah, the thing it did, though. Too. It ran circles around Firefox and performance. Web pages yeah. that you could barely More scroll through on your single core. Your single core Intel or AMD CPU that were chugging, chug. Chrome came out. Hey, look, everything works. Oh, okay. You know what? I'll give up all of my plugins. I'm telling a personal story here. And, you know, plugins Mm -hmm. are not Firefox was such a bad experience at the time. People jump ship, myself included. I did. I made that jump. Now, Firefox, they've been trying to course correct. It takes a long time to turn around a project of that size. It takes a long time to turn around a ship. And I wish them the best of luck, but they, they still got to do some course correction to um, really get, they, they've made leaps and about progress wise. They've went from not really doing much to, Hey, they're, they're trying again. Is that, is that fair to say, Pedro, wouldn't you give them that much? It, it is. I have actually been using Firefox as my main browser on everything that I can, except, you know, the two netbooks, uh, because the processors on those are a little too slow. And yes, Chrome is still faster. Come on, Mozilla, please. <laughs> I really wish I could but, remember yeah. the, um, 
There, there's a spinoff of opera. Uh, Vivaldi? No, no, no <laughs> opera before it went to WebKit. Oh, yeah, yeah, there is. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I can't remember the name of it, but I think I, yeah. <laughs> I, I can't yeah. remember the name of it right now. I wish I could say that so I could call Pedro and Norman. Like, why don't you run? <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, the, Vivaldi also works very well in the. Um, uh, in the netbooks, and yeah, it seems to be a thing with the engine that Firefox is using, whatever it's called nowadays, Proton, Quantum, it's one of them. But yeah, it is, it's inevitable, especially when you're in this position with Firefox, where you have a product that does work, but it's not the best, it's not the fastest, it's not the most widely supported, because let's face it, with Chrome having 65% of the share nowadays, that's the default. And Edge now is just Chrome with the Microsoft skin on it that apparently sends less telemetry than regular Chrome. So it's hard, it's already hard to compete against the default that comes installed with the desktop operating system that has the highest share. What are your thoughts on Chromium and Google free Chrome? The Google Chrome. Uh, Chromium it, it is really nice. a yeah. very good browser. Uh, I wish uh, Google hadn't, you know, hampered uh, its ability to do the things that people like it to do but i think chromium is a fine browser and i think i'm not alone in that one because there's a bunch of other browsers out there that um are based on chromium so <laughs> yeah. i was really sad to hear this as well because firefox is my default as well and and um, i've even been using sea monkey lately you know gone back to the old sea monkey which is based off classic Firefox. Pale Moon! <laughs> <laughs> yes, Pale Moon. <laughs> yes. So I was really sad to hear this, especially now that the top three browsers are Chromium or WebKit based. That just, that made me sad. Mm -hmm. But, you know, since, oh boy, since Microsoft Edge was rolled out to millions of people via Windows 10 update in June... Uh, things changed and more people started using the Microsoft Edge browser and it is actually honestly quite good. It's responsive and works. It does work beautifully on Linux. So <laughs> that's the other. It's not my one. main yeah. browser, can, but it does work on Linux pretty well. That line. I will say I have <laughs> yet and I don't see a future where I will install Edge on Linux. I, I have to. <laughs> there are, uh, I'm pragmatic. I don't have blind allegiance to any project, be it commercial or open source. I'm going to use whatever works the best at the time, which angers some people. But hey, I'm, I, I got to get stuff done. I, you know, I'm not trying to convert people. So use what works best for you. But like most of you, got a big soft spot in the yeah. um, empty cavity where my heart should be for Firefox. Oh, like man, I I root for them right like right now. I'm still rooting for Firefox. I'm like, come on, let's come back and do it again. Because that's what I want to see. And I think that's what a lot of you want to see too. I also never thought I'd back to the Microsoft thing and be living in a world where Microsoft released a browser on Linux. <laughs> released a browser, released their single <laughs> yeah. most popular communications uh, application. Which that is a browser. Released since Skype, which is effectively also Chrome. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, no, it, 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 this is a weird world we live in where Microsoft really does seem to love Linux. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you say that, you uh, say that, so we gotta do here that. Here it comes. Yep, <laughs> yes. Microsoft does in fact <laughs> love Linux. Uh, where would you put this picture, Mateus? Uh, I, I put this squarely under morbid curiosity and this guy's yes. full of it. <laughs> Absolutely. Although uh, Juan Manuel Rey there uh, does have a reason because he is a Microsoft Azure engineer. So th th there's probably a reason that he got, it's like, okay, let's actually download the thing and see what it actually does. And yeah, it's CBL Mariner. It's the other distro does that Microsoft created. Sea shanties to you while it's installing. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be disappointed if it didn't. I would, I would uh, at least yeah. put it Yarr. over here if it did. <laughs> <laughs> it is, yeah, it, it has a graphical installer. Uh, he spun it up on uh, vSphere and according to him is very similar to um, Photonus or PhotonOS, whichever pronunciation you prefer, which is the VMware distro. 
it, it uses RPM. Uh, it doesn't use regular DNF like your fedoras and your uh, red hats. Yes, it uses tiny DNF, mm -hmm. which is... I actually have to try that, uh, install that on one of the netbooks, see if that's actually faster than uh, proper DNF, because proper DNF is really bad on old CPUs, like really bad. But uh, CBL Mariner is... Well, it's a base... Um, very close uh, to Photon OS again, but uh, not as tightly integrated into the Azure ec uh, ecosystem. Uh, you can actually use it for 3,300 packages in the repository. It actually makes it very, very interesting. Uh, but yeah, it is not as tightly integrated and not meant to be just the network backend for Azure like Sonic. Uh, this one is more general purpose prototyping type of situation, at least from his description. So... I don't know. Could be worth a look. Someone try to get a GUI running on it. But this <laughs> is get it running things. on actual hardware. <laughs> right at the beginning of his blog post, he points out there are no ISOs for this. You have to build this yourself if you yep. want to mm -hmm. uh, spool it up. Which immediately, <laughs> my mor morbid curiosity is like, we're going to go be morbidly curious about something else. <laughs> There's uh, instructions to build it um, on 1804. Mm. So if you're running 1804, you can just follow the thing and you get yourself an ISO. I get it exists there. Ta da! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, another Microsoft Linux distro. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> they could have at least called it Clippy. Let's be real. Yeah. Okay. No, that's going they're, to be the oh, desktop distro. <laughs> I think they're saving Azure that one OS. for the desktop distro. <laughs> oh, <man. sighs> Okay, we're going to jump into a slice of pie, but real quick, uh, if you like what we do, you want to support us, head over to patreon.com forward slash Linux Gamecast. That's how we finance everything, pay for the hosting, bandwidth, and all the other fun shenanigans that we get up to pretty much all, all week. We do stream, what, five days a week now? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you like this show, this mm -hmm. is just the metal. Patrons get access to the pre-show and the post-show all in podcast format and video, so if you need an extra two hours... Of this nonsense, we got it in spades, plus a bonus show for patrons, the pre-pre-super shows. And if you want something, social commentary on what's going on in life and what weirdness. Oh, makeup. Uh, makeup application techniques. It's, um, it's a surprisingly involved topic, as it turns out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we go places. I have to write the show title <laughs> descriptions for that. Thing. Like, what? Okay, fine. <laughs> pretty much got it down but thank you each and every one of you making this possible uh let's keep on doing it and uh yay we do have wish zones uh jill's got yeah. one it's got a bunch of <laughs> like plushy pink stuff on it pedro pedro's a <laughs> lot a lot of pink yeah <laughs> pedro's is like mostly like studs and leather but hey man don't judge it uh oh <laughs> <laughs> you gotta sweat a little bit, you know, to burn off the bit. calories. <laughs> Let me know I'm real. <clears throat> <laughs> I got one for the studio. Uh, we don't use that appropriately, but uh, if you're curious about stuff that I'm planning on buying, planning to beat up with a Linux stick, that is also available. All that's on our website, linuxemcast.com, and that's also how you end up as one of these blinky names behind me, where you will be publicly shamed for your fiscal irresponsibility. Now. <laughs> now. We get into a slice of pie. It's kind of like the tax man's Yay. version. Cherry pie. <laughs> pie. <laughs> Very one-sided pie, that one. But yeah. this one, well, this one is interesting. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's a um, <laughs> bit of a crazy project by uh, Rod Rodri042. I was just going to call him Rodrigo because that's probably his name, but whatever. Uh, GBA Remote Play. It is... Um, yeah, what you can see there on the video, if you're just listening to the audio version, is uh, someone playing Crash Bandicoot on a PlayStation emulator on a Game Boy Advance. Admittedly, it's one that has the um, so cool. the modded <laughs> screen, so it actually has some, you know, backlight. But yeah, it is Crash Bandicoot playing through the Game Boy Advance. How did they do that? No through idea. Through the link cable. Oh. <laughs> Yes, uh, the link cable in the Game Boy Advance apparently has a bunch of different modes that you can set it to. And uh, there's normal mode, which caps uh, the um, the transfer rate at 256 kilobits per second at 8-bit. 
uh, or 200, uh, sorry, two megabits at 32 bit. Uh, there's also multiplayer mode, which does um, 11, th- uh, sorry, um, 100,000, uh, 115,200 bits per second at 16 bit, uh, or the general purpose IO for, you know, just the typical uh, link cable connectivity. But the way that they've done it, they can send out the GPIO from a Raspberry Pi to the Game Boy and stream not just the game video content to the magnificent resolution of uh, 240 <laughs> by 160, because this is a, <laughs> yes. it's a Game Boy Advance. Uh, and you can just uh, trick the Game Boy, even without a cartridge in it, to just go into multiplayer mode. And oh, not multiplayer mode, normal mode at two megabits, and that's how they stream. Mm. It it doesn't look great because again, it's a Game Boy Advance, but you can stream and play using the controls on the Game Boy. Now it just needs a network, like a proper wireless network adapter, uh, and n- not the mm-hmm. not the official one. That one would require you to you know breach social distancing guidelines. So. We need a proper one <laughs> and do this over the air. That'd no. be a thing. <laughs> Very cool. Let's go. I was oh impressed God. it uses 60 frames per second. <laughs> That's awesome. But when you're dealing 60 with hertz display? <laughs> yeah. When, when, when the grand pixels of um, your entire resolution qualifies as a rounding error? <laughs> <laughs> when your pixels are five digits? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Total amount of pixels, five digits. You can get away with the, uh, what was it, like two megabits. Like, yeah, all right, all right. Yeah. Get, I guess I'm <laughs> he, he even went and added interlacing so you can feel like a proper hipster when you do this. Yes. It's kind of <laughs> Hey, if you want to tell us uh, things that you're up to, playing around with Linux, Raspberry Pis, or anything like that, as long as it doesn't have to be, binary blobs can be involved. We've discussed this. You can send us yes. notes <laughs> at linuxgamecast.com. <laughs> Or he's throwing it to Pedro, and Pedro's like, Oh, okay. meow, 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 right. meow, uh, meow, You started meow, that meow, off, meow, so I was meow. just gonna let you go. Meow, 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 meow. Contact form, uh, you can find it cleverly hidden under the contact button on the uh, nav bar at the top. So just click on that and uh, pick LWDW as the topic that you'd like to send your message. Uh, you know, constructive uh, criticism, feedback. You can Say disparaging uh, remarks about, about your our family. Threaten, threaten yeah. to show up. And you can even come hang out on the show if we like it. We're pretty yes. easy to. If you have something really interesting and you want to be on video to talk about it, mm-hmm. do that. Come and talk to but us. Once you're done doing this, <laughs> go to the contact form and fill it out. Okay. <laughs> All right, beautiful people. We do have to bounce out of here. We are short on time, but we'll be back next week and. Until then, let's roll some credits and thank the lovely people. Aw, we have some uh, new followers and viewers because of our Linux tag. Isn't that cool? I guess the Linux tag is working. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ali Razan Zahani plays. <laughs> thank you. And Lowell Cosmo and Henrik <laughs> EFFC <laughs> Studio. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting that wrong, I know. <laughs> uh, I'm reading see. it in the distance. Let me see if I can find... There we go. 49 <laughs> minutes ago. So, Starbuck Tech, thank you. Cenobite Off Sec, thank you. Lol Cosmo, thank yeah, you. Starbuck. Uh, and Rick Off Custodio, or F Custodio. Yeah, that's it. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> we see you next week, everyone. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Love Bye. you. Thank you, all our lovely patrons and viewers. Mm-hmm. <laughs>